plant nutrition. And you've had a lot of this already in uh, BZ120. You've had this all in Plant Fizz. So this is basically kind of a refresher. And probably the primary thing you need to think about is like every or other organism on this planet, is 90% water. Depending on the textbook that you read, the textbook that you follow, or how old it is, there are in between 16 and 19 essential elements for plant growth. We're going to talk about 17 here. Uh, the basics are 16, but 17 for this particular thing. And what I want to do more than anything else is I want to group them into um, these four categories. The four categories of non-fertilizer essential elements, prim primary macronutrients, secondary macronutrients, and micronutrients. And that's what I want to focus on more than anything else. <coughs> when I say non-fertilizer element, what I'm talking about is an essential element that we get, that a plant takes up um, that doesn't come through the root system. And that's basically carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That we're not applying them as a fertilizer. In greenhouse technology, however, we do apply carbon as a fertilizer. And we'll talk about that in a week or two, when we talk about carbon dioxide injection into the greenhouse. So the non-fertilizer elements, uh, of our essential elements, carbon, 41% of the dry weight of a plant, when you take the water out, 6% of the dry weight is hydrogen, and 42% is oxygen. And these are primary in our carbohydrates. What's the definition of an essential element? Who knows? What it, who can tell me what a definition of an essential element is? A plant can do its basic metabolism without... A plant requires that element for basic metabolism. What else? To complete its life cycle. Who said that? Very good. And to complete its life cycle means what? From, from seed germination through seed growth, maturity to flowering to generating seed. To complete its entire life cycle. There are a lot of elements that a plant can grow and function in one way or another and be absent of maybe something else. Um, sometimes we don't need all the essential elements. Yes? Do you want to change the color scheme? <laughs> 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 Do I want to change my color scheme? No. I just ordered a new laptop because I got tired of this. This laptop is five years old, so. Huh? <laughs> You'll take it? Well, I'll lock it. I'm going to use it for a, a piece of equipment in the greenhouses. So, all right. So, to be thank you. You'll take it. Yeah. Do you know where the best place in town to buy a computer? Surplus. Hmm. CSU Surplus. You can go over to CSU Surplus, which is on Lake Street. It's about what 103 or something like that. Hmm? Right next to the railroad tracks, okay? And and you can walk in there. Anybody can buy anything there you want. You got a credit card, you got cash, it doesn't matter. They'll sell it to you. Um, you can go in there and buy probably a, a laptop that'll work fairly well for 150 bucks. Hmm? Mm hmm? Do not tell that to my children. <laughs> they want an Xbox so bad, and I'm saying, my God, you got the state-of-the-art desktop in your house. Why do you want an Xbox? <laughs> I know, because all their friends have it. I don't know. All right, let's refocus. <laughs> all right, so... The, the I'm trying. I'm got to put a, a marker in here somewhere so I can restart, cut this out of the <laughs> recording. <laughs> Does anybody listen to the recordings? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but you, you you're you're doing that telling your wa- telling my wife that you're listening to music. You're listening to my s- riveting. <laughs> No, I watch the videos at home. Okay, okay. Um, John works in a cubicle next to my wife, so. Right? Yeah. Not the same cubicle, right? No. I just do cubicles. Yeah. Okay, just make sure there's a level of separation there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's keeping up with whom? Uh, never mind. <laughs> After the... Um, Non-fertilizer essential elements, which is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, we have what we call the primary macronutrients. And you all know what the primary uh, macronutrients are. We call them primary um, and we call them macro, not because any one is more important than another, because there really isn't anything more, but th- anything more important than the other. They're primary macronutrients because these are the nutrients that are used in the greatest volume Therefore, they're the nutrients that are going to be deficient first. And those are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, these are, we think of this as N, P, and K. And actually, all of our fertilizer proportions are based upon nitrogen. We say, how many parts per million you're injecting in your system? How much fertilizer are you using? It's all based on nitrogen because nitrogen is used in the greatest volume. Therefore, it is going to be used the qu- most quickly, and it's the one that's going to be uh, deficient first. Uh, nitrogen is 4% of the dry weight, phosphorus is half a percent, and potassium is 4% of the dry weight of a plant. Secondary macronutrients, uh, there's usually enough in a traditional native field soil that we don't usually fertilize it with calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. In a hydroponic situation where you're supplying all of the nutrients, you have to think about it. Now this is, this is the same whether you're doing a conventional or an organic fertilizer. You've got to provide NPK and calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Large amounts of calcium and magnesium typically, uh, most of the time in an, a greenhouse situation, we're adding limestone. And limestone is primarily calcium, um, bicar- calcium bicarbonate or carbonate or magnesium carbonate bicarbonate. Question. Are we adding limestone or are we adding dolomite? Okay, limestone is calcium carbonate and bicarbonate. Dolomitic limestone is a, mo- a blended molecule of calcium and magnesium carbonates and bicarbonates. Now, if you were to go up to the lime quarry up outside of Livermore, they primarily are mining calcium bicarbonate, and the dolomite is actually a fine layer in between their, with their quarrying and the native soil and native bedrock. They think of dolomitic limestone as a waste product because they're trying to get the premium calcium bicarbonate because they're used selling it for other products. Horticulture is one of the primary uses for dolomite, and we want the, the, mag, and we want the dolomite for the magnesium. Sulfur is almost present in most fertilizer elements as a sulfate ion, anion, and so we typically uh, don't have to fertilize with sulfur hardly ever. In fact, I have never actually seen a sulfur deficiency except in a laboratory. So calcium is 1% of the dry weight, magnesium is half a percent, sulfur is half a percent. So these are the secondary macronutrients. The primary macronutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Secondary are calcium, magnesium, sulfur. And then we jump to what we call the micronutrients. Now, micronutrients are called micronutrients because they're used in very small quantities. Does that make them any less important than the primary macros, secondary macros? The answer is no. We still have to have them to complete the life cycle of a plant. Do we call them micronutrients? Do we call them trace elements? Do we call them whatever? Uh, I really don't care. You'll see different brands called different things. Uh, One of the common fertilizers we use is called STEM, which is an acronym, Soluble Trace Element Mix. 
I really don't care. We talk about micronutrients or uh, because that's what the American Society of Agronomy has chosen that that's the, the name. But you'll hear minor elements, trace elements throughout the literature in every place. There's no difference. The primary micronutrients, well, the rest of them is iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, molybdenum, chlorine, and nickel. And you can see they're required in very, very small quantities. Some textbooks don't include nickel as an essential. Some textbooks don't include chlorine. These two kind of go back and forth. And I'm not going to make you memorize them anyway, so question. Molybdenum? Yeah. Molybdenum in floriculture is an absolute essential element. Okay, because um, molybdenum is actually, and any I think it's I w I'm going to say it's required in every plant because molybdenum is a divalent cation is responsible for the activation of a compound called uh, an enzyme called nitrate reductase. Okay, we'll talk about carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon. They're found in the air and water. And uh, the plants take up carbon dioxide and through the energy of the sun convert that to water and starches, sugars, and oxygen. And these are the energy supply of the plant. We call that photosynthesis. We assimilate carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's taken up through the stomata, not in the soil. Water is taken up from the roots. Oxygen is a byproduct, and the sugars and starches are the building blocks of the plant. You guys have gone through this dozens of times. It doesn't change. And this is as much of the Calvin Benson cycle you have to learn in this class. Okay. So carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, carbon dioxide fertility comes from the air not from degrading and taking up in organic matter, OK? That's not where carbon comes from. It's carbon dioxide. It's from the atmosphere. O oxygen, the plants use oxygen both from the atmosphere and also from the breaking down of carbon dioxide, but mostly from the atmosphere for respiration. Hydrogen comes from water. Nitrogen is the first of the primary macro uh, elements. <clears throat> part of all living cells, part of proteins, uh, enzymes, uh, part of chlorophyll, um, helps plants grow. It comes from fertilizer application. Um, if you have a leguminous plant with a symbiotic relationship, they are able to, to fix nitrogen in that way, uh, rhizobium bacteria and such as that but it's part of all living cells. Nitrogen is freely available, and we typically see, um, and as it's taken up by the plant, oftentimes we see it as deficient in our growing tips, okay? Yellowing of foliage. In the next lecture we talk about fertility. We'll, we'll show you some pictures of some, of some deficiencies of specific elements. Phosphorus, the next of the, of the three primaries, is again part of photosynthate, photosynthesis. Um, adenosine triphosphate is part of the uh, enzyme system. Uh, phosphorus is also uh, part of the membranes, you know, your phospholipids are making up this, the membranes of your cells. Typically, uh, high oil plants, starches, sugars, it's uh, part of your chemical energy transformation. Rapid growth, oftentimes we think of phosphorus as being required for root development, uh, better blooming. Um, your book talks about bone meal and, and superphosphate fertilizers and stuff like this. Bone meal uh, in the greenhouse environment, again, in the six, eight weeks that you're growing a bedding plant or something like that, it's still a rock. 
you're not going to get that much. So most people will fertilize with either phosphoric acid or a other phosphate source, simple superphosphate or treble superphosphate fertilizers. Comes from the, the root system, takes up the phosphorus. Potassium. Potassium um, is used in large quantities, almost equal to nitrogen. Okay. It's part of the protein building sy system. It's part of the photosynthesis system. Phosphorus is required for fruit quality. Uh, potassium is required for fruit quality, flower quality. However, it's not found as a constituent of any tissue in the plant. It's freely available as a cation. Okay? Okay. K plus. All right. It is part of an osmoregulation system. In your own body, potassium is important for osmoregulation. If you uh, get your potassium out of balance, you don't feel good from exercising too much or not drinking enough water or not eating enough potassium. Uh, leg cramps is related to potassium deficiency. The, um, a lot of what Gatorade is potassium, um, such as that. So it's in plant, it's uh, an osmoregulator as well. It's responsible for the regulation of stomatal opening and closing. And it's, uh, we get it into the plant primarily through fertility as well. So the three primary macro elements are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, N, P, and K. The secondary macronutrients, the first one is calcium. Most people that grow crops never think too much about calcium nutrition. When you get in the greenhouse, however, calcium nutrition becomes important because we're not growing in a, na in a native soil. Calcium is an essential part of cell wall structure. It's part of the tra uh, normal transport of el other elements. It adds strength to the cell walls, just as calcium adds strength to your own bodies through bone structure. In fact, when we see calcium deficiency in poinsettias, the bract doesn't, and the leaves don't expand completely, and it takes on a, a look where uh, looks like a Venetian blind because you have faster growth in between the veins and the veins aren't growing fast enough so you're not laying down uh, xylem and flo uh, phloem fast enough so it creates a puckering effect. It's quite common. And also we see uh, burning of, of uh, blossom tips and burning of uh, leaf edges. For instance, blossom end rot is typically a calcium deficiency, blossom end rot on tomatoes. And that's from calcium not being taken up completely. Calcium is a, um, its uptake is, relies completely on mass flow of water. So if you irregularly water your plants, and that's why we see more blossom end rot in tomatoes and in patio plants and in pots than we do in the ground is because it, the water is uh, wet and dry, wet and dry, wet and dry. And so we're getting irregular calcium uptake. We get calcium from dolomitic limestone, of course, gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, and superphosphate or ca other fertilizers like calcium nitrate and things like that. The second of the secondary macronutrients is magnesium. Um, magnesium is part of chlorophyll. You replace magnesium in chlorophyll with iron. The chlorophyll molecule is a heme structure. What's it going to look like? If you take the magnesium out and replace it with, it's not quite chemically correct, but if you were to take it, magnesium out, replace it with iron, what would it look like? Hemoglobin, exactly. It would look like blood. 
Okay, so hemoglobin is with iron, chlorophyll is with magnesium. It's basic, a heme structure is that molecule. Um, so it's part of, it's essential for photosynthesis. It, it activates many enzymes. It is a divalent cation. Divalent means what? Two what? Two plus charges. And so what it does in enzyme structure, it gloms on to different parts of the enzyme, brings it together and creates that tertiary structure that activates an enzyme. Okay. We get it from soil minerals, organic material, fertilizers, dolomitic limestone, gives you some magnesium. If we need a shot of magnesium, the fastest way to get it into the plant is by fertilizing with Epsom salts. That's magnesium sulfate. Um, Agricultural grade, of course, is cheaper than what you buy at the grocery store. The third of the three secondary macro <coughs> elements is sulfur. <coughs> you have to actually create a sulfur deficiency in the laboratory because sulfur is so pre prevalent as a sulfate as uh, the anion in a lot of our fertilizers, and it's readily available in the degradation of organic matter, you just about have to create a sulfur deficiency. But it is, it does happen in very hydroponic systems. Um, it's part of chlorophyll formation, it's part of many of our amino acids, it's part of root growth, seed production, plant growth. Um, we typically don't see a deficiency with it. In fact, I have only personally seen it when we have to create it in the laboratory. So we have to screen our fertilizers, make sure there's no sulfur contamination. Okay. So the primary macros are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Secondary macros are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. All right. Our non-fertilizer essentials are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now we're going to jump into the micros. The first one is iron. It's essential for chlorophyll. Um, it's essential in a lot of different enzymes. Iron is one of those micronutrients that it changes in availability based upon the pH of your root substrate. Low pHs, iron is readily available. High pHs, iron is limited in availability. So you can actually have plenty of iron in the soil, but if the pH is wrong, it's becoming limited. <clears throat> the other one, the next one is manganese. Iron has got typically three charges. Manganese is another divalent cation, and it's uh, part of enzyme synth uh, synthesis. It's required for nitrogen metabolism. Again, it's a divalent cation. It holds the enzyme structures together. Zinc <coughs> excuse me, is essential for carbohydrate development. It's essential for consumption of sugars. Again, zinc. Uh, as part of enzyme synthesis. When we see zinc deficiency, it actually interrupts the, me the metabolism of gibberellic acid. So if we see plants that have really stunted internode length, oftentimes that could be related to a zinc deficiency. Um, some tree fruits um, that are grown on very alkaline soils, the, they have what's called a rosetting pattern on the foliage because the internodes are so compressed. In the greenhouse, if we see compressed internodes, it's typically because we have aphids, not zinc deficiency. <laughs> because in micros, it's really pretty hard to have a zinc deficiency. Copper, utilization of proteins. I, a copper is another one of those that you have to create the deficiency in the lab. Um, boron, however, is one that we regularly see uh, micronutrient deficiency in Colorado. Um, it's essential for uh, the development, again, of um, seed and fruit development. We see boron deficiency oftentimes in um, plants like Ophiopogon and, and Dracaenas. 
uh, we'll get a, a big, uh, the uh, meristem will cluster and clump and become distorted. And what's happening is it's, di it's disrupting um, uh, the apical dominance to the deficiency. We see boron deficiency in Colorado because of our water. Our water in Colorado that's coming out of the mountains is so clean and pure that there's no boron contamination. So oftentimes in Colorado, especially old carnation growers would have to irrigate with a boron substitute. The cheapest bor boron substitute is laundry detergent, 20 borax, okay? And I saw somebody saying 20 mule team borax, Ronald, thinking Ronald Reagan, weren't you? <laughs> I'm older than I look, aren't I? Um, but, so we'll have to put in, um, and we typically see boron deficiency in plants that have been kept in a pot too long. Uh, for instance, uh, Ophiopogon is one of those plants that uses spikes in the middle of a container, and if they didn't grow them all out, they'll bunch them all up in a, in a crate and throw them under the bench and try to hold them till next season. Then they try to force them out, and the boron will be depleted, and they'll grow stunted, and it's, we can get the plants uh, fed back up with it, but it's, it's a challenge. Molybdenum, everybody say it together, molybdenum. It's one of those hard ones to say. <laughs> molybdenum, molybdenum is one of those elements that we will see deficiency in greenhouse crops as well, specifically poinsettias. Um, molybdenum is required for the activation of the enzyme nitrate reductase. In other words, it takes the nitrate molecule and breaks it into nitrogen. You know, plants have to take up their fertilizer elements as cations and anions, okay? It doesn't matter if they're organic or inorganic. They've all got to be in that or inorganic form for the plant to take them up, okay? Nitrate is not usable by the plant until it's converted in to the nitrogen is taken out and extracted from the oxygen. So we have to have nitrate reductase to reduce that molecule. What happens in a poinsettia, if you have a molybdenum deficiency, is the nitrate will accumulate on the margin of the leaf and actually call mar cause marginal leaf burn. So we have to make sure that we put uh, molybdenum in our fertilizer mix especially in Colorado, because our water is so pure. We don't have a lot of other water sources. These, for, these micronutrients are already there just because they're there, all right? We use a, a fertilizer called ammonium molybdate, and we just blend it in at, at, micro, at, blend, at very low levels. A lot of the modern fertilizers, full spectrum fertilizers, have adequate molybdenum in them. Chloride, um, you have to, uh, chloride is not chlorine. Chloride is the anion form of chlorine gas. Chlorine gas, chlorine Cl2 is chlorine gas. That's pretty toxic. Chloride is, we get that from fertilizer salts and stuff like this. We typically, once again, chloride and nickel, you have to create those deficiencies in the laboratory. So how do you figure out what you're gonna use? And we're just going to talk generic fertilizers. And I know that, uh, how many are in Dr. Stonecker's greenhouse class? Okay. Um, he'll talk about organic products. I'm going to talk about conventional products. Okay. That's where we separate. All fertilizers, by law, have the first number is nitrogen. The second number is actually not phosphorus, but phosphate. And the third number is potash, okay, which refers to K2O. Now there's this very specific reason why we use K2O and P2O5. And it goes back to the 1800s. And that's when we first had the first procedures for doing chemical analysis for fertilizers and the system was established as a standard in the 1800s because
because these were done through oxidation reduction analyses and they were analyzing for the phosphate and the potash. So some greenhouse management teachers will have you require out, calculate what the actual P and the actual K is. I'm more willing, I want you to stick it with the available pot, these numbers, because that way you won't be confused later on in your career. Some European fertilizers do not report in, in potash and phosphate, but the actual P and the actual K. So you have to be aware of what the label is saying. Because if you look at the label, it'll say P2O5 or K2O. Okay. <coughs> yes? When you, when you had the plant tissue analysis earlier in the slides, were those expressed also in those? Those are expressed as actual elemental, actual elemental levels. Okay. okay. So is there no other practical reason why they express it that way other than tradition? Tradition. Okay. Tradition. Okay, so these are percentages. A bag of 10, 10, 10 has 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphate, 10% potash. So if it's a 50 pound bag, that's how you figure it out. There are three forms of nitrogen that are supplied to a plant through a fertilizer. I don't care if the fertilizer is conventional or organic. These are the three forms that a plant can take up nitrogen. Urea is an organic form, organic in that it's an organic molecule in the traditional sense because it's got carbon. Urea is not, the plant can't use it. It has to convert it to ammonium or nitrate. Ammonium is a form, it's the cation form, the plant doesn't use it either effectively. It can store it. It can store it to the point where it becomes toxic. But yet again, it's got to be converted to nitrate. Yes? Does the plant itself convert to urea or does it Both ways. It happens both ways. The plant would uh, much rather take it up as nitrate. It's easier to take up. Now, because of we're working with a small buffered volume of potting soil and we don't have unless you put field soil in it or a lot of clay you have little buffering capacity and we typically like to design our greenhouse fertilizer ratios to be less than 40 percent or less of your nitrogen in the am ammoniacal form now the ammoniacal and the urea forms are the cheapest forms of fertilizer but if you get into ammonium toxicity uh, it'll drive the pH down. It um, has a tendency to um, ha be even more uh, more uh, of an issue at when the, the potting soil is cold or if it's got too much moisture. Now remember, urea is the same as ammonium because it's converted for the plant um, to be assimilated into the plant. Nitrates are readily taken up. But they all got to be converted to nitrates eventually. Bacterial conversion is very important in our soil. Remember, I want you to treat that pot where your roots are as a biosphere. And uh, when it's cold, the bacterial activity is lower and run into problems. Ammonium toxicity low pH soil, we get into rolled margins, chlorotic leaves, necrotic, necrotic shoot tips, or necrotic leaves, and the bur leaves burn. Now, in our soil zone, when our root grows into the soil, and it takes up nitrate, nitrate is an anion, it's a negative charge, life has to be balanced, so we have to give off an equal negative charge in form of a hydroxyl group. And when that negative charge is given off, the pH is going to go up. Converse, we take up ammonium, give off hydrogen, and the pH goes down. Now, in the field, in, let's say, a farmer, they typically, in the fall, will 
especially a corn farmer, will inject ammonium or urea into their soil in the fall. No plants. Why would they do that? It's time to metabolize or become part of the biosphere and convert into the nitrate form so it's ready to go when the plants are there. Okay. It's also a cation, so the cation is captured and held on by the, by the clay molecules by the cation exchange capacity. If they were to put nitrate in the fall, where's that ni what's going to nitrate where's the nitrate going to be when it's time to plant? It's going to be in the groundwater. It's gone. So that's why a lot of um, traditional conventional farmers use the ammoniacal forms because it lasts longer in the, in the, in the soil. In the greenhouse, we've got uh, a smaller volume, less shorter time, and nitrates work better. Yes? Does that liquid ammonium in those big tanks that you Yes, it's, um, it's liquefied ammonium and when it when they're putting it into the injecting it into the ground, it, it, it's a liquid ammonium liquid gas or something like that. There's lots of different ways to do it. So, <clears throat> so uptake of all cations lower the pH of the soil. Uptake of all anions raise the pH of the soil. Nitrogen has the greatest impact because it's taken up in a greater rate than any other compound. Any other, you know, potassium, calcium, magnesium, uh, sulfates, um, they all will change the pH. Nitrogen has the greatest impact because it changed, because it's taken up in the greatest amount. So the other things to think about is a fertilizer like 2177 is 100% ammonium, triple 20, is 70% ammonium, 2010 20 is 40% ammonium, 15 by 15 is 22% ammonium. Now what happens here is this is mostly uh, the nitrate is in calcium nitrate and magnesium nitrate form, which is, gives us calcium and magnesium nutrition, which is also important. Okay. All right, so this is where what we didn't start on Tuesday. So the rate of nitrogen application is pretty much dependent on your fertilization practices. You'll see application rates anywhere from 240, 200 to 600 parts per million nitrogen. Now remember, nitrogen is that compound we use in the greatest volume, the plant uses in the greatest volume. Therefore, we typically apply all of our um, fertilizer recommendations based upon nitrogen itself. If you're using what we call a constant feed system, in other words, with every irrigation you're applying fertilizer, we use a, a lower rate. Question? Is this dependent upon what kind of media you're using? What the nitrogen ratio is? What the application is. It depends on the plants, depends on the medium, it depends upon how fast you want to grow the crop. The answer is yes. It depends on everything. And that's the job of a manager to decide what's the best rate. So when you say 240 to 600, that's kind of a wide range. That is a very wide range. So if you're applying on a constant feed, you're going to apply anywhere from 90, and you're not going to go much more than 255 parts per million nitrogen with every irrigation. If you're fertilizing once or twice a week, or maybe once or twice every two weeks, you're going to go at the higher rates. Some growers will only hit their crops with fertilizer once a week and they'll use a higher fertilizer rate and every other irrigation is with clear water. Which one is best? It depends on the crop, depends on your mechanization, depends on the le level of sophistication that you want to grow your crop at. You also need to categorize according to whether the plant is a light feeder or a heavy feeder. Some, a tomato plant, is we would call that a heavy feeder. Uh, bulb crops are not heavy feeders, they're light feeders. If you're using a sub-irrigation system or ebb and flood or something like that, we typically cut the rate in half. So use an even lower ratio. 
So most of our greenhouse crops, we use a one-to-one -one nitrogen to potassium ratio. Most greenhouse crops, just one-to-one. -one. Equal parts nitrogen, e nitrogen and potassium, N and K. But there's, it depends on the crop again. If you're an azalea grower, they need three to one. Some begonias, two to one. Foliage plants, one and a half to one. Carnations, one to one and a half. Cyclamens, one to two. What's the take home message? Well, sometimes you may have to have a custom feed for specific crops. And what a grower will do is try to block their crops according to temperature requirements and nutrient requirements so they can su supply it within the best realm that you can do because you're not going to do injection systems for every different crop on the planet. Some potting soils, some potting media that we design has plenty of phosphates in it. If it's a soil based fertilizer, phosphates usually aren't required either. It's got field soil. However, most growers like to add phosphate to their fertilizer feed because they don't know how much is in the in the potting soil or they don't know the degree of leaching or they don't know the formulation of the phosphate. So most growers add phosphate fertilizer in at one half the rate of nitrogen. So it's the ratio is one to one and a half to one to a half to one in P and K, which is 20, 10, 20. And the 15 by 15 is 313. So our standard fertilizers are fit on these schedules. Secondary macronutrients, you need to do a water test. You need to check your supply. Um, depending on the crop, we typically look for a ratio of three to one three milliequivalents of calcium to one milliequivalent of magnesium. So the ratio to calcium magnesium is also important. Now remember, we're working in potting soils that are basically a inorganic substrate. I mean, the plant, we've got to feed that plant everything it needs to grow, especially in hydroponics. The next thing that's important to know is the alkalinity. And we talked about this in lab this week. Um, alkalinity, um, we need to know whether it's a problem. If the alkalinity is over three milliequivalents per liter, it's typically not a problem, but it can be an issue if you don't have a magnesium and calcium in the system. Calcium and magnesium, we supply that typically through dolomitic limestone, through calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate, regular limestone, or gypsum, calcium sulfate. A lot of the growers that I work with that have a high sodium absorption ratio in their soil, where they got an excessive amount of sodium, one of the things that we'll do to exclude some of the sodium from the plant is add a boost of calcium sulfate in the potting mix at about five pounds per cubic yard, and that will alleviate high SAR water it's a, it's a trick that's commonly used in Texas and across the southeastern United States with poor water and it does work especially with the nursery growers to eliminate some of that high sodium absorption ratio yes can question can we go crush up limestone and make rock dust and that'll suffice for can we crush up limestone and make rock dust well that's what limestone is yeah. it's crushed up light is crushed up rock dust mm -hmm. from limestone quarries. There's a big one up at Livermore. That's exactly what they do. And if you live on Owl Creek Canyon Road, you are constantly plagued by explosions. So, because they're blowing up overburdened to loosen up the rock. So we can just crush up rocks to get all these new Or you can crush up limestone. Well, a rock isn't necessarily limestone. Right. Uh, limestone is not granite. Okay. Don't take that for granite. Boo. Everybody give me the eye roll. Okay. You're not near as good as my teenage boys. 
Okay. Epsom salts is a single salt presentation. Uh, magnesium sulfate. Uh, you can get it at the drugstore, but it's a lot cheaper at the farmer's co-op. Trust me. <laughs> but if you need some fast, if you've got a uh, magnesium deficiency on your chrysanthemum crop, which is pretty common, and you need a boost, and you don't need, to, and you haven't got time to wait and order the stuff in, just go to the drugstore and get a, a pound package, and you can hit your crop, and it'll go up there real fast. That was like that. The plants respond quicker to a foliar spray with the minerals. Or no? They typically respond fastest to a root zone application. Plants have evolved to take up their nutrients through the root system. You can do a foliar spray on products like calcium and magnesium, and calcium is quite common because it, um, it's hard to translocate calcium quickly, okay? Because it requires mass flow. Magnesium, you get a faster response to the roots. Remember that if you're spraying a nutrient onto your foliage, it's only taken up by the foliage when the nutrient is in a liquid form. And there is this incredible barrier on a leaf called the cuticle, which is this maxi membrane, which is wa waxy membrane, that is designed to keep water in. And so it's hard to get water, and we keep water inside the leaf, so we want to get water from the outside in, it's a barrier to pass. What time of day can you, would you think that you can get your nutrients into the system fastest? Morning, early, in the early in the morning. Through the waxy membrane. Through the waxy membrane of the leaf. We're talking about the leaf. You're talking about uptake through the root system. You're right. Early in the morning through the root system. Through the foliage. Hottest time of the day. Because the cuticle is the softest, but then again, it's going to dry the fastest, so it's a challenge. It's, you got to. It's easy to get it in there when it'll stay liquid phase the longest. So it might be in the evening. The times I've worked with foliar nutrient sprays, which has been a long time ago, we typically tried to do it towards dusk when the cuticle was still fairly soft, and we could keep the water in the liquid phase for the longest period. So. Spray it everywhere, hope to get it in. Okay, sulfur, we get it through Epsom salts, gypsum, fertilizers, um, micronutrients. Some, most fertilizers have some. Uh, the higher end calcium nitrates, the higher end magnesium nitrates that are manufactured with a high degree of uh, precision, especially the ones that come out of Israel. Um, have virtually nothing else in them. They're exceedingly clean. How, so, but if you get the lesser expensive fertilizers, a lot of time they have a lot of micronutrients blended in them, uh, just as um, contaminants. But the mes most important thing to do is to read the label and pay attention to the pH. Probably the easiest way to get uh, micronutrients into your system is use a couple of products. One of them is called Soluble Trace Element Mix, or STEM. And STEM and Micromax and fritted trace elements, these are the shotgun approach. We don't know what it's going to be deficient in, so we just give it everything. Is that a problem? No, it's probably the cheapest way to do it. Um, stem is a soluble mix. We can, we can inject it with every irrigation, or we can do it once a month or once a week. FTE is a granular uh, product, and what they do is they take and they blend the fertilizers, the micronutrients with glass, uh, molten glass, and then they uh, shatter it. They solidify it, shatter it, and they grind it into a powder. And as the glass erodes away from the, the compound, or we call it a frit, uh, it releases the, the element, so it's slowly available. And then there's all kinds of other products, Micromax, such as that. Um, there are lots of brands out there. The fertilizer that you use is going to be based upon your crop needs, your pH, your, how much you're going to monitor, your water quality, your pre-plant program, what you're going to blend in at the early part of your soil. All commercial fertilizers, they, the manufacturers put a little fertilizer charge in there. So when you plant in it, your plants get an immediate jump. And that's more so for the grower to convince the grower that their, fertil that their potting soil is better than the others because your plants grew faster. They grew faster because they put fertilizer in it. 
Yes. Is the advantage to the frit the slow release? The absolutely. It's a slow release product. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. All right.